Hello and welcome to another episode of North 100. I'm Serge, joining me as always, we have Jeremy White, Alex Stacey, and Liam Coughlin. Today, we're gonna to be talking about advanced deck building tips. So not only brewing, but as well as tuning a list, talking about which points you get in, and sort of like metagame, fun stuff like that. Worth mentioning, this podcast is brought to you by you over at Patreon at patreon.com slash loaningreadyrun. Thank you for all of your support. Let's start us off with our normal segment. Liam, what is the best card you're not playing? All right, so the best card you're not playing this week is Children of Corliss, and all the rules text is on this one, so it's hard for me <laughs> to mess up. All right. um, so this is a single white creature, uh, creature type human rebel cleric. Those types are not super relevant. Okay. It's a 1-1. One, one. Uh, but most importantly, it has the text, Sacrifice Children of Coralis, you gain life equal to the life you've lost this turn. All right, what does this go in? Uh, exactly one deck. Uh, <laughs> Lin Civi Commander? No, not that one. Uh, it goes into uh, a deck called Tin Fins. Um, Tin Fins is a deck in Highlander? It is, in fact, a deck in Highlander. All right, go What's on. What's Tin Fins? All right, so Tin Fins is a strategy that involves reanimating a gristle brand with haste. Uh, drawing a bunch of cards with said Gristlebrand, and then utilizing Children of Corliss to gain back all the life you've lost from paying seven life to Gristlebrand. Uh, to basically, you don't actually draw your deck every time. You can draw your deck. It's uh, possible. Harder on a hundred card format, but okay. Yeah, I, I've done it. Had to count my deck to make sure I wasn't gonna <laughs> deck. Um, and then huh. eventually you either kill people with uh, a Tendrils of Agony. Uh, sometimes if you manage to draw enough cards before combat, you can reanimate an Emrakul as well. Uh, with haste. And it's uh, import important to note you're using the instant speed reanimation effects in this deck, uh, like Shallow Grave and Gorios, Gorios Vengeance. Yeah. yeah. Mo Which are both notably. one and a black. Uh, Gorios Vengeance gets a legendary creature back from the bin with haste, and Shallow Grave gets the top creature of your bin back with haste. Um, this is relevant in Highlander? Yeah, yeah. I 3-1 yeah. with this deck. I lost in the finals. No I've, I've also 3-1 with this. Liam's literal copy. Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jared and I played against the same person yeah. two weeks run or like two I mean, tournaments running. I played against him and beat him with this deck and then he got paired against Jared also playing this deck and he was like, oh my god, this must be so popular. Maybe I need to metagame against The thing it. That, that generally speaking keeps some of these like legacy and vintage decks out of our format is the fact that you can only play one copy of the key cards. But yeah. Sometimes that's not enough to stop you. Yeah. Huh. It, it doesn't actually matter. Um, you have bur Buried Alive and you have not Tomb, which is enough ways to get Gristlebrand in the graveyard. There's lots of ways to find those cards. And so the reason I'm talking about Children of Corliss is uh, this is actually the most irreplaceable card in the deck. Um, you can play Yawgmoth's Bargain instead of Gristlebrand. That works. Uh, there's lots of other things that you can do for reanimation. There's plenty of those. There's plenty of ways to tutor for Entomb. There is only one Children of Corliss. There's only one effect like this. Trust me, I've looked. Uh, yeah, sorry, Yawgmoth's Bargain is a four mana uh, Six four, four black black enchantment that says skip your draw step, pay one life, draw a card. So it's actually in some ways better than Gristlebrand if you can get it back. And, and just to be clarified, the, the pay one life colon draw a card is an activated ability, so you can yeah. do it as many time. times as so you want, pay, whenever you, can, you yeah, want. Just pay down to 19, sack Children of Corliss. I am pay down to shocked again. Yeah. that the key card in this deck is Children of Corliss. Well, like, if you if you asked me on paper, I would not have thought that this is what makes the deck playable. It's the second best not pointed card in the deck. Gristlebrand's the best yeah. one. Yeah, Gristlebrand's the best. Actually, sorry, it might be third. And Tomb is probably the best one. Gristlebrand's huh. second. This card's definitely third, though. It's insane. Um, it's really good. And you'll note that since it's a creature, it combos really well with all your other reanimation effects so that you can reanimate this. So yeah. if you like pay 14, play this, gain 14, you've drawn 28 cards, then you can <laughs> usually reanimate 14. this again. No, then you draw another 28. This is how you can deck yourself. You can end up drawing like 104 yeah, cards if, you're, if, you're, if you manage to recur this Because if you, if you pay 14, then sack your children, of course, to gain 14, then draw another 14, then reanimate children, of course, You've lost 28 life this turn. Whoa! So then if you sack it a second time, you're gaining 28, and you've now drawn 56 cards. Yeah. <laughs> That's too spicy. Yeah. So anyway, this card's nuts. Uh, it's really good in the deck. Uh, special shout out, I guess the other two cards that people will probably be wondering, I'll, I'll post this list. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah, 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 please. Uh, but the other two important cards are Sacrifice and Burnt Offering, yeah. both of which cost a single black mana, their instance, that make let you sacrifice a creature, and Sacrifice gives you black mana equal to its converted mana cost, and bur Burnt Offering gives you any combination of black and red mana equal to its converted mana cost. So the other thing you're doing is you're trying to sacrifice your Gristlebrand for eight black mana. Wow. You just I have, blew my mind. I Sorry. Have, I have one last question. Okay. Why is it called Tin Fins? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> well, or, or do you not know? Because I haven't. That figured was going to be out. my question too. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a couple of explanations. Uh, okay. That go down in the lore. One is if you look at Gristlebrand, he's kind of got some tin, thinny looking arms. You know, they his sort of reaper size of arms could be confused for tin fins, perhaps. Okay. Uh, the other reason, and yeah, you see, see what I mean? These are kind of tin fins. The other reason, and this <laughs> one's way weirder, okay. is, is for weird. some reason people called this deck the Onion Baji for a little while, <laughs> and I don't know why. I, I have actual no explanation, but Onion Baji is like deep fried onion, basically, and those deep fried onions look like tin fins. What? It's true. It's, it, it's after the legacy deck. Yeah. They, I don't they, they, basically, the rule about tin fins is no one knows its name, why it's named this way. And if you play the deck and someone asks, you just have to make up some explanation. It's like, okay, it. I can't talk about tin fins without going onion bodgy on you. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> the full onion bodgy. I have a headache. Well, that's great because now we get to talk about deck building. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> some onion bodgy. <laughs> I have well, a headache. Also, I'm hungry. Well, <laughs> Liam, thank you very much for, for teaching us all about tin fins. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this actually uh, segues nicely into the first thing I wanted to talk about, which is it's important to try things in Highlander when you're, when you're brewing a new list because oh, yeah. you, it's impossible to determine if a card is good or not if you've never played it. And The same thing can be said for an entire archetype. As, yeah. as we discovered on our last podcast that... We weren't sure that Merfolk was a thing, and it 3-1 on Monday. So, yeah, give it a shot. And and tons of popular archetypes now that are considered Tier 1 or Tier 1.5. Lots of people scoffed at in the past, like when Robin Sorensen started playing Stifle and really heavy tempo creatures, lots of people thought he was crazy, and mm -hmm. like people play Flame Tongue Cavu, like your tempo creatures are never going to get there, and now... Sorensen is possibly the most recognizable tempo deck. deck. Yeah. yeah. Hold on tight to your dreams. Yeah. I suppose the one the one caveat to that is a weird idea still needs good cards. Yeah. Like you can't go you can't go too far down down a brewing tangent and have no support for yeah. it and be like, why doesn't this work? Yeah. You you can't just sort of like like this is the reason why we were all initially reasonably skeptical about a, about a deck like Merfolk, right? Yeah. You you look at like yeah the first ten cards in that deck are pretty powerful, yep. and then the next sixty are <laughs> really bad, um, and or I, we thought they were really bad. Yeah. It turns out maybe they're not quite maybe, as bad as yeah, we thought. As opposed to like something like Goblins, where like the first like eighty, 80 cards are good, and <laughs> I was well, say the yeah, last the, twenty the cards basic are mountains are all good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But but basically, when you're brewing, right, you wanna you wanna be thinking about okay, I have this cool idea that I want to play with, and, and like to use the Tenfins example again, I mean this deck is still playing Demonic Tutor, Vampiric Tutor, Mystical Tutor, like it's held together by some very potent cards. You know, we're playing all the one mana blue cantrips, we're playing all this hand attack, we're playing obviously powerful cards mm. to coincide with our sacrifices and Children's of Coralist, but we're also playing good cards, and you want to make sure that you you find a balance. Yeah. Um, I think this goes next, or this goes really well to the next segment, which is uh, what, what are our brew methods? And I kind of want to spend one or two minutes each just going mm -hmm. through how it starts off. Jer, how do you brew? Well, it sort of depends what what type of deck I'm trying to build. I, I'm sort of infamous for playing many different archetypes. Uh, if I'm playing an, an aggro deck, I'll sort of just get a pile of aggro-y looking cards together and then start cutting the ones that do the least damage to the opponent. If I'm trying to brew a combo deck, I'll usually start by figuring out what sort of what sort of things I need to make my combo work. Like I'll decide what pointed tutors I'm playing, what non-pointed tutors I'm playing, get the combo pieces I need in there, look for redundancy, and then try to find ways to either not die or get my combo together faster. Hmm. If I'm playing control, I'll think about what what a things people are playing and how to best answer those things yeah. at the moment because like sometimes people are playing goblin sometimes people are playing jeskai those decks require different slightly answers. different answers and sometimes if i'm playing mid-range it's sort of similar to aggro i'll put the put a pile of 200 cards together and cut any card that's not a two for one hmm. i i have a very like this is spoken to somebody who's trying to do very well in a tournament my brewing method is often what is the best way to achieve my vision on on <laughs> a, on a theme or on a mechanic or something I'm trying to exploit. So it normally starts off of like, what's my key inspiration? Because I can't be bothered to make a deck unless I'm inspired. 
uh, and then it's research. So let me go through uh, standard, modern, legacy, vintage, EDH. Let me find every playable card that's in that in the scope of that problem, and then cut it down to a hundred, uh, and then ask myself, how does it win? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you don't always answer that question. Do you? No, sometimes, sometimes the answer is it doesn't. But I had a bunch of fun getting there. <laughs> I mean, you you so far have managed to avoid the much maligned zero zero four record in a Highlander tournament. Well, it's because I often drop and get a milkshake after O two. But no, 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 no. I draws. four draws, <laughs> not four losses. We know you've gone O four before. That's fine. We've all done. That. Have we hard talked to about the wall? legendary Stefan Bard zero zero four on prison yet? No, no, but I guess that's the dream of the prison player, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, he yeah. drew many games in game one. Oh my god! Yes. Didn't have three, a way to three win of games. three of those draws were not draws in three. They were draws in zero. <laughs> Nobody won a game. <laughs> That sounds miserable. <laughs> and also delightful. All right. Wow. Well, he had four match Crum prints. Crumbling Sanctuary MVP. All right, Alex, tell us what you brought. I will frequently find myself looking at a card or several cards that I was like, I really want to put this in a deck. Like, okay. I'll start with Lotleth Troll. Yeah. And nice. I'll just be like, okay, this card doesn't cost much mana. It's aggressive. It's in these two colors. You know, what can I find that's similar to that? And I ended up with something like Black Mold, which is a uh, Golgari aggro deck that I've been tinkering with, and a couple other players have been tinkering with it. That's actually the most flattering thing to happen as a deck builder, is when other people ape your list yeah. and just like start working on it. Yeah, yeah, it's like, can you ship me this and then I'll try and tune it a bit? You're yeah. Like, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Sort of like halfway between what you said and what Liam was talking about earlier. Um, I will if, if I get an idea in my head about you know an archetype that exists or like some sort of strategy or some sort of combo maybe, um, I will I'll do that research and find all the cards I can that uh, that work in that archetype and list them. Mm -hmm. And if it looks like there's enough to cut down, I'll be like maybe this could be a deck. But many times I'll get like. 20 playables in and then just run out of gas. Yeah. I'll just be like, oh, maybe I could do like this tribe. It's like, no, nah, well's dry. Mm, zombie lander, eh? Well, no, zombies is close. close. I, I'm gonna, you know what? I'm going to try. If Merfolk yeah. 3 and 1, I'm going to try building <laughs> zombies, by gosh. Uh, it's worth mentioning that Gatherer is also an excellent research, or pardon me, an excellent research and, and knowledge tool. Because you can just type in the mechanic you want under the text box and Gatherer be like, how many cycling yeah. cards are there? Advanced search gatherers, yeah. definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. spent a lot of time there. I, I've used that function It's really a powerful. Lot. Yeah. Like, you can search for uh, keywords, for super types, subtypes. You can also search for, like, specific mana. Yeah. One of the most useful search functions when I'm building a deck is searching for converted mana cost of, like, this amount or less. Yeah. Because you're like, I want aggro, so like three or less, or maybe four or less, because I don't care about anything higher. With the caveat that there are some cards that cost less than it looks like. Yeah. yeah. So there's a, a handful of cards that are secret. Like you know, Delve, Delve cards, Force like of Will, alternate cost. Yeah. yeah. Those are usually pretty easy to find, though. Yeah. Graham. It's worth noting, <clears throat> pardon me, it's worth <laughs> noting also for Gatherer that there are some instances where a card is printed outside of a card has an ability but isn't printed in the set that has that ability as a keyword yeah so when you're looking for it on gatherer as an example if you search landfall you won't get i think it was called zendikar's royal that was in magic origins yeah or, that, or even uh, that has landfall, landfall but but it's printed as whenever a land enters the battlefield yeah. you know so There's be sure a to couple like that be sure to also search like the rules text that you're yeah, looking for even like, tireless tracker a pretty Taz's popular landfall, card yeah. has has the ability. pseudo landfall yeah, like, ability but bone, doesn't bone have Baker, i don't think actually has morbid on it no nope. it doesn't so but it's a morbid card yeah so all right liam tell us how you brew yeah, <laughs> so um, it came to me in a dream. No, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I sort of have a, a couple of different processes for how I, I end up playing bad decks, my decks. <laughs> um, so one thing, I, I will often brew around a theme, right? Yep. So uh, this is how you end up with five-color charms as a deck. <laughs> uh, I've also played five-color flash and four-color flash, yep. uh, as in flash the keyword. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So, yeah. Not, so, not Flash Hulk. No, no. Just like all my things are at instant speed. Sure. Okay. So like, yeah. So so stuff like that. Uh, I'll often brew, brew around a theme. When you do stuff like that, Gather is really good. Yeah. You want to think about, okay, I want to play with this theme. What is this theme good at? 
Um, in the case of Flash, it's, okay, I never have to tap out, so I'm obviously going to play counter spells. You, you sort of build from there. In the case of Charms, it's, I'm prepared for every occasion, uh, so I'm just going to obviously win every round and I have proper mana. Uh, that's not how it actually plays out. Um, um, but so that, that's one way that I brew it. I look at a theme, I do that way. Um, another thing that I tend to do a fair amount is that I really like uh, kind of cannibalizing existing archetypes and putting them together. Sure. Um, so mm, yeah, um, yeah. So like looking at two different strategies that are are very potent and and either maybe putting them into a color combination they haven't been played in before or uh, taking two of them and putting them together. Um, so like, you know, when when Pod was being a, a was a really successful deck with Kiki Jiki, I thought, well, what if you played a deck that didn't have the capability to cast Kiki Jiki, but was still doing the pod stuff with it. Yeah, sometimes you can take like two standard modern legacy decks that are like thematically kind of similar and yep. just sort of like yep. jam them and together. They work. Well, sometimes you have to do that yeah, because sometimes you a, have to because you well, you're in a singleton cards. format. You don't have enough depth to do one classic one. So yeah. like, what's the nearest relevant yeah, thing so that you, supports you know, my sometimes theme? Sometimes you could have like two decks, you know, in, that exist in legacy that have you know graveyard interaction as a theme and you know if you like marry all those cards together it's like oh this actually kind of works almost hmm. yeah and and then the last process that i i have for when i brew is i i will sometimes just get an idea which is very vague right so i'll say to myself i want to play blue green control or i want to play tin fins or i want to try like so either it's either coming from just an abstract concept or maybe a more specific deck archetype that exists in another format but i'll look at something that already exists and try and make it work in Highlander. It's like, I want to lose with Big White. I, I mean, that I haven't played that do. deck yet. The, the, the trick is, I always get Jeremy to play this deck for nice. me. I've that's, never played that's it. That's the problem. He yeah. always rushes yeah. me into playing his ridiculous <laughs> ideas. Oh, dear. Well, look, I don't have the cards to play them all the time. So I think, I think an important thing to note in Highlander is you don't have to be a brewer. So we talked yeah. about our brew process, but oftentimes what happens is you... you You've built the deck, and you want to make it better. And this is where I think we, we can move into some more of the advanced stuff in it, which is how do you take an yeah. idea that you have a proof of concept of, you have 100 cards that are a deck, you know, you have a curve, it has a strategy, it's pretty streamlined. Yeah, it's like you've either, you've either brewed a deck yourself, or you've just, like, net decked off of something that yeah, performed yeah, well, yeah. which is an equally valid way to build decks in any format. It's like, I have a, I have a deck, how do I make it... Leaner. How do I judge which cards are overperforming, which cards are underperforming, and how do I how do I change stuff there? Mm -hmm. uh, Jared, do you have some insights on what you do when you're tuning a list? Just again, like a, a quick one before we go deep on any topics. Yeah, and I'm just going to point something out quickly that sure. we're all pretty biased towards the brewing yeah. spectrum. So, like on on this podcast, we're all definitely leaning pretty heavy towards the brewing as opposed to tuning. We're we're likely to play different decks. Like I play different decks every week. Mm. Surge plays. Surge decks. He has his like own <laughs> own column of decks yeah. he I'm, plays. That I'm kind no. of the same way. Yeah, Alex but, has some um, spicy decks. Liam, he played five color charms. That's yeah. so cool Enough said. though. Enough said. Yeah. So when when I'm tuning a deck, what I'll often do is uh, this is actually a, another category of decks that I play. Is I'll go back a couple of years to a deck I or somebody else played a couple years ago and hasn't really been played since and mm -hmm. I'll look what did that deck gain over the last two years or what changed to make that deck better in the last two years like I'll, I'll often do that with uh, either Hermit Druid or Oath of Druids mm. not many people play those decks and those those two cards are both incredibly yep. powerful yep. were you the one who played Druid Tribal were we trying to steal everyone's land that happened too right I've played that Druid was a Tribal, dream. Yeah. No, oh, no, 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 that one was real. We stole everyone's lands. I forget what that card is called. Guilt Leaf Arch Druid. That one. I'm yeah. sorry. You're gonna have to tell me what this card is. Uh, three green green. Whenever you cast a Druid spell, you draw a card. Tap seven untapped Druids you control. Gain control of all lands <laughs> target player controls. Yeah, I, I could have sworn this had happened. I have played Druid Tribal and Highlander. Went three one. <laughs> Powerful match. I'm so angry. This card exists. <laughs> I activated Guild Leaf. I've activated Guild Leaf Archdruids activated ability multiple times in a single tournament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gain control of all lands target player control. I don't My only play good decks. Hurts. How many druids are there? There's Enough. a ton. Yeah. Most almost, of the elves that make mana are Almost druids. every mana are elf dork druids? is. Yeah. Like all all the one mana mana dorks are druids. Basically, there's one sh notable shaman, but yeah, uh, the old death right salmon. Devoted druid gets in. Like, there's so huh. many druids. Huh? Yeah. 
oh, so many okay. druids. <laughs> All right. <laughs> wow. Sure. Okay. okay. <laughs> We've been going. We're going deeper and deeper on the druids. Here. How many colors was this druid deck? Two. I I played blue green because I played. Uh, oh, coiling oracle is a druid. It's a snake elf druid. I played. Oh! I played. Uh, glimpse combos as well with Intruder Alarm. I played Opposition. I played Cloudstone Curio. Huh. I played Wirewood Symbiote. There were so many ways to make infinite mana in this deck. Holy huh. man. I played uh, Concordant Crossroads to give my druids haste <laughs> so they could tap for mana. And if I'm glimpsing, I'll often net mana. So, Jer, yeah? if we were updating Druid Tribal, because <laughs> you haven't played it in like two years or something. I played it last year. Sure. But what, would you, what, what kind of process would you take to do so? So I'd mostly be looking for oh, there's one more more playable druids. That's, that's <laughs> obviously step one. Bring more druids. Oh, another and then, one. And then potentially more uh, glimpse type effects. Those are the two main things. That, so would you maybe play a Vanquisher's like, Banner uh, on druid? I'd I'd think about it. That one might be a little too Liam, much mana. No. Liam, <laughs> but no. Glimpse. I'd, I'd Look, think about it. Summer Wall Sage is one of the best cards weekend. in the deck. Yeah. We're talking about the the card Glimpse of Nature. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is yeah like, Graham's been going off on druids here. Yeah, so, nature is, it's like one green, is it a sorcery? One yep. green sorcery, whenever you cast a creature spell this turn, draw a card. Yeah, like the Legacy Elves deck. Yeah, yeah this is one of the hardest. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just like you, you kind of go off with and, this card. And Beck Call is a little different. It says whenever a creature enters the battlefield, this turn, draw a card. And you notably play some ways to make. Uh, Creature tokens like I played. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, I played Wolf Briar Elemental. I played Ant Queen, and I played. Uh, I think it's called Lissalana Hunt Master. She yeah, tap makes green and then tapper to mm. make a, a green one one elf. And so with Intruder Alarm, uh, those those will often go infinite. And with Beck, you draw your deck and. Hmm. All right, we deal with the lands. <laughs> we don't we pretty deep yeah, into that yeah, one. Sorry, my bad, my bad. Yeah, so so I got 156 it. druids, by the way. Wow. I told you. you know, well, and did you see how many of the new ones that are good? No. Like, I saw Sylvan uh, Advocate. Yeah, which Sylvan is Advocate's good. real. That card's real yeah, good. Yeah, you don't want it in that deck. But here's the thing. When you steal all their lands, <laughs> it gets bigger. Does it? Yeah. Thank oh, you. Uh, six oh my god, it does. I, I hate that you're right. <laughs> Liam, you need, you need I to, resent when, that you're when, right about that. When deck building, you need to be careful about playing cards that win more. Mm. Uh, yes, this is a, a difficult to explain yeah, topic, so and we, we visited it very briefly uh, when we were talking about that uh, haste copy creature. Yeah, Tialani's yeah. whatever. Skin Skin shifter. Skin yeah. shifter. Yeah. Because, like, the. the well, I'll let you explain so, what winning more is and why so, you shouldn't so worry about it. You want to be careful about playing cards that are only good when you're ahead yeah. and in their best case scenario. Yeah. And and these cards can shift from deck to deck. Like we were just talking about Sylvan Advocate in this Druids deck. That's the Druids deck is trying to make a bunch of mana, cast a bunch of Druids and do silly things with, with a lot of mana. And Sylvan Advocate doesn't actually do anything to help accomplish that game plan. You see, you see what yeah, it I says. It is, it is a druid, <laughs> but that doesn't necessarily mean you want to play it. Like just because it draws a card while you have Guilt Leaf Arch Druid in play, doesn't make it playable in this deck. Like that's like the best case scenario. You already have your like key card in play, and you're, you have things to do. Like you, you don't really need. Uh, a card that's good once you ste once you've tapped your seven druids to take all their lands. Yeah, the example we used last week is like, you know, copying your Inferno Titan. It's like if you already have resolved an untapped and are attacking with an Inferno Titan, you're probably you don't fine. really need a second one. All right, yeah. I guess I'm willing to accept that if your opponent has zero lands, this might be overkill. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. It's well, like they have no lands. Who cares? I think that's a good point for for tuning and and sort of when I look at at my method, um, it's. Are the cards I'm playing actually helping me win, or are they complementary to your strategy? Yeah, and and so recently I was tuning. Uh, I'm playing this this uh, very aggressive artifact, almost affinity like list that I call Workshop Weenie, and I had all of these mid range cards. I was playing white, and I was like, all right, I have to have like Avon Mind Sensor and Mirren Crusader and Mother of Ruins in there, and it was actually Alex who pointed out like these cards are good. But are they helping your strategy? Like, These cards are all super good cards, and yeah. this is a tricky part of tuning, is like cutting cards that are 
bananas. They're just good. They're good cards, and you and you think of it as an auto include. Uh, but I ended up changing them for more synergistic, less powerful artifact creatures. And what that let the deck do is perform way more consistently. And, and I found that was more important. I could have more powerful starts off of Mishra's Workshop and Ancient Tomb mm -hmm. and City of Traders than I ever could getting stuck on these double white or single white cards yeah, that I, mean, uh, that I like couldn't always cast. Goblins could play like Grim Lavamancer. That card is super good and would probably be pretty good in that deck. Uh, it is not a goblin. No, it's a human shaman. It's a human shaman. So maybe it goes so in our shaman's deck. Maybe it doesn't <laughs> get in there. And that's oh, it's wizard! Crazy. Damn it! Ah. That, that's that's one thing to keep in mind like when this. you're when you're tuning and building a deck is whether your deck is more of a a good stuff deck mm -hmm. or a synergy based deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you're playing a synergy based deck, you have to be careful about putting too many good cards. You just just good cards yeah. like cards that don't actively help your game plan, you usually need a couple, like, you need some removal spells, you need some way to interact with your opponent on some level, typically, yeah. unless There's your deck is... that you're just going to have to play anyways, because yeah. you have those colors. But, you know, if you if you can help it, you know, you can play stuff that is complementary. Like, for example, like, you play Dispatch in your deck. Yeah. Yeah, and Dispatch is this insane one-mana white uh, instant spell that says tap target creature. But if you have Metal Craft, which is activated if you have three or more artifacts, then it's just exile target creature. So it's better than Swords to Plowshare and Path to Exile, but it requires a certain amount of synergy to and set up. And you play both of those as well? I play Swords, Path, and Dispatch, as well as Council's Judgment. Those are like the four removal spells I play in the deck. And Dispatch is fantastic, unless I have a hand that's Dispatch, Mother of Ruins, Mirren Crusader, <laughs> and Avon Mind Sensor. All of a sudden, Dispatch becomes the worst card in my deck because it doesn't have any support. Yeah. yeah. An another card like that would be Aethersworn Cannonist. Yeah. It's a card that's, that's not good in every deck. Like, sometimes you'll play it if there's a bunch of people playing Storm. What, is, what does that card do? But it's, it's one in a white yeah. for a 2-2. Two -two. It's an artifact creature. And it says each player who has cast a non-artifact spell this turn can't cast additional non-artifact spells. Yeah. So in, it stops people playing multiple spells a turn unless those are artifacts. Yeah. So you can cast one as many artifact spells as you want or one non-artifact spell each turn. So in your deck, this doesn't slow you down no. because you're just playing mostly, basically just playing artifact spells. You have yeah, a handful yeah, yeah. of non-artifact spells, but your odds of wanting to cast multiples of those in a turn, not super high. Uh, but most other people have mostly non-artifact spells, so it's going to slow them down a lot if they want to cast multiple spells. Yeah, like the aggro decks probably don't care for this card. Combo decks hate this card. Yeah, Storm. Storm's like, why? Well, Storm yes. can't win through yeah. this card. So uh, they can. Yeah, can Alex, they? before yeah, we jump, we'll just kill it. Well, yeah, but no, they, yeah, sure, if they don't, if they don't have the removal play, spell, uh, they yeah. can still win actually because of Oriox Salvagers now. Oh, just sure. Yeah, they can mm -hmm. bomb man you to death. Yeah. So or Oriox Salvagers is three and a white for a two four has an activated ability, one in a white, return target artifact card with converted mana cost one or less from your graveyard to your hand. So they use that in conjunction with either Black Lotus or Lion's Eye Diamond, which is a zero mana artifact that makes three mana, and a spell bomb, you typically pyrite spell bomb, yeah. which is a one mana artifact that you can pay red to sacrifice it to deal two damage. Yeah, so you can make infinite mana, and you can make infinite spell bomb activations. Yeah. Uh, also importantly, if you have, they play all the like spheres and stars, so if you have one of those in the graveyard, you can also just draw your whole deck. We're getting so off topic. Well, I agree. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> Tell me what you're tuning. Uh, it helps to test a lot. Okay. I think like you want to play a bunch of games with a bunch of different people, which I don't always end up doing. Oh, nice. Yeah. But um, I think that that's probably the best data you can get. It's just like play games, see how cards perform, see yeah. how cards overperform or underperform. Um, because, yeah, you'll you'll have these best laid plans where you know, it's like, oh, this card's going to be super sweet. And then, like, every time you draw it, it's like, this is dead. It does mm -hmm. nothing. And you're just like, well, maybe it isn't good. And you can sometimes identify cards, you know, that are that are really good in a vacuum that's like, this is just not doing what my deck wants to. Like, you know, cards like Eternal Witness is um, one of these things that people just jam into every single deck that, ha you know, has access to forests. What's that card do? Uh, it's... Uh, one green green mm -hmm. for a two one. When it enters the battlefield, uh, return target card from your graveyard to your hand. Super good effect. Really, really strong. It's like just a, a great good stuff card. Not good in every deck. I would never play this in aggro, for example. Yeah, it's I agree. just not good. Um, it's real good in mid range and control and you know anything that's trying to like recycle creatures and stuff. But uh, 
this would be real disappointing to flip over when you're trying to aggro your opponent out on like gruel or something. You're just like, oh, it's just gonna take two turns to do anything. <laughs> Whereas, you know, if you were on control, this card is like, this is super nuts, it gets my wrath back, or something. Liam, you got any uh, secret tech for tuning? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I, do you have anything no, else? No, no, just kidding. I think it's really important to try things. So what happens a lot of the time is when you're going to build a deck and you've got your deck built, you're looking at your 100 cards, and once you play it long enough, you sort of start to think, you get you get stuck in this mindset of like, oh, this card was good in this occasion, so I would I can never cut it. And... <laughs> You've got to be willing to take chances and cut cards even knowing that they are reasonable cards mm. uh, in order to try other things. And this is especially true when, when new cards come out. Yeah. So, like, That's for instance, when, like, when the expertise cycle came out, um, mm. cards like Baral's expertise in particular, when you look at it, and when I was looking at it, I thought, this card's probably not better than anything else I'm playing. In my deck, but I in in four color scape shift was what I was playing. What's uh, Brawl's expertise? It's three blue blue for a sorcery that says return up to tar three target creatures or artifacts to their owner's hand. You may cast a four mana spell from your hand without paying its mana cost. Hmm. Um, so when you when when I looked at this, and I was thinking about it. I was like, well, this effect is potentially very good in, in four color scape shift, um, but is it better than wrath? Is it better than another hmm. ramp spell? Is it better than mystical teachings to find my combo? And ultimately, you can't just figure that out by thinking about it. You can't learn how to play magic or determine what magic cards are good purely by visualization. So I had to like make a conscious choice. I cut a card from my deck that I knew was good, and this card turned out to be very, very good. Uh, it, it turns out that it's basically time walk plus cast another spell a lot of the time. And, and Oh, because of the tempo potential? Yeah, you just bounce their three, their three th threats, and you get to play a ramp spell or play some kind of draw spell or something mm. like that play a tutor, uh, so it was very potent, but I would have never found that out otherwise, right? Notable, uh, it's uh, uh, CMC four or less, and uh, Scape Shift is four or less. Yep. So Ooh. you could like take out all of their relevant hate cards and then Scape Shift for free off it. Yep, you can. Um, you can also do things like uh, the best ramp spells in that deck all cost four as well. Really? Um, You're playing the four mana ramp spells? Sky, Sky Shroud's claim yeah, is, Sky Shroud the claim is, 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 huh. the, is the best unpointed card in the deck. Huh. Except for Scape really? Shift, maybe. What does it do? It's three and a green. Search your library for two forest cards. It does not say basic. What? Put them untapped? Into play. They come into play untapped, and then you shuffle your library. What? So all, all the best decks with the draw with the all the best draws with the deck involve like ramp spell, ramp spell, sky shroud claim, ramp spell, kill you on turn four. Yeah. Um Yikes. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. so Huh. Two forest cards in this case being including duels. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. almost always Tropical Island breeding pool. Yeah, and he holds the blue up. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, I, I'm assuming everyone here has a maybe board, and that kind of lends to that as oh, well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, there's always... I always have, like, 110 cards I want to put in my 100-card deck, and... and... Try, like, 130. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's important to not just throw those things out, too. You want to you wanna hold on to your maybe board. It's really easy, and this was something I had to stop myself from doing. I would build my deck... And I, my, my deck would be 130 cards, and I would, I would cut 60 cards from my deck to make it work. And then I would take those 60 cards, and they'd go back in the boxes. Mm. And I would never think about them again. And I would play the deck, and then when all of a sudden I was thinking, oh, maybe I want to change some of the cards in the deck, I realized I, I should keep these cards out this that I've been thinking that I thought about putting in the deck initially. Yeah. This is the reason I really like using um, the sideboard slot on like electronic deck building utilities and there's an actual maybe board slot on tap deck yeah, that yeah. I use all the time because it's especially useful when you share it with people because they can look at your main deck and then look at your maybe board and be like you should probably be playing this in your main because it's super good or it's yeah. like this what is what does this card even do I've never heard of it in my life hmm. so uh, let's look at the sort of the heart of a deck, and this can come up during brewing and tuning. But uh, how do you figure out which points you play when you're when you're when you're making or, mm. or changing your deck? You want to go first, Jer? Um, yeah. So typically, you, as we talked about in our deck building uh, episode, you want to figure out your deck's main game plan. If you're an aggro deck, you're figuring out your win condition is getting your opponent to zero mm. uh, asap. Asap. So. Typically, the cards that let you do that the fastest are the the Moxin. Hmm. Uh, there's not too many aggressively slanted pointed cards, uh, so you're just looking to for ways to accelerate your game plan that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. And the Moxin just let you start casting two drops on turn one, multiple one drops on turn one, those types of things. Uh, once you start getting outside of aggro decks. 
I actually think mid-range point spreads are maybe the most interesting. Yeah, uh, it's really cause, hard. Because you mocks in are really good. You mm -hmm. have, if, especially if you're blue, you have access to all the powerful blue pointed cards. Like, do you are you? Is it worth it spending six of your points on Ancestral Recall or Time Walk? Uh, is it better off spending those six points on maybe two on Mystical Tutor, one on Dig Through Time, one on Treasure Cruise, one on True Name Nemesis, one, one on Merchant on, Scroll? Yeah. yeah. And you get those five cards for the price of one of those other cards. So yeah. like, it's it's so hard to figure out the the toss up, and you sort of have to figure out uh, if you're playing one of the Ancestral Recall or Time Walk, you probably want to put in ways to find those cards more often to make them better. So if, if your deck can afford to do that, maybe playing one of those cards is better. If you're not going to worry about putting cards specifically to find those cards, maybe playing a wider variety of points is better because then you'll you'll end up drawing your pointed cards more, more often and that gives you a better chance to win more games sometimes. It's also mm -hmm. interesting, I think, uh, it can be easy to get trapped into the notion that you must play all 10 points. Yeah, and that's there's, fair. There's, there's a bunch of decks that are 9-point decks. I agree. That you Zero just point goblins. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So you can actually, yeah, you can build a real good deck for no points mm -hmm. at all. Yeah, definitely. And, but, and and that's true. But I, the other thing that I I think that I'm I'm trying to eliminate here is that like it can be really tempting once you get to nine points to say there's got to be a one point card I can jam into my deck, mm -hmm. and it's just not always true. Like I, I love when goblins was so dominant, and it was a zero point list. We're just like, how do we stop this deck? <laughs> What do we point? How do we how no. do we beat this? And the, like, the way we to pointed... stop the deck was to play different decks. I know, I know. But it's <laughs> like, they're like, do we point Goblin Recruiter? And I thought it was pointed for like a couple months. We're like, no, this it is a mistake. Recruiter this was is... pointed for it a while. Was... But yeah, like, that turned out that wasn't the problem. It's no. just like, hey, maybe we should meta against this <laughs> completely linear single color strategy. Play a Kitchen Finks. <laughs> it's like they, they don't like Kitchen Finks. Uh, play actually, a wall. This is fantastic, and it brings us to another point I wanted to talk about, which is the meta game. Which is which is so important, and it, and it comes up, and, and Jared was talking about this before uh, about control. Like control isn't just a deck. You have to decide what you're hating out. Because if you're against an aggressive meta, you have to play earlier wraths. If you're against uh, mid range, you can play later wraths or different threats and stuff like that. And you have to know what you're coming up against to to make those decisions. Yeah. And and I think this affects your points and it affects everything. Um, actually, that's a that's a, like a great example because uh, the Gruel deck I built recently, mm -hmm. um, I jammed in every single anti life gain spell I could, mm -hmm. um, which is a lot of them now. And when I played on uh, Monday, I was like, I really wish these were all artifact hate cards. Like I was like, I wish this was. I had Tin Street Hooligan and Vithian Renegades and like Manglehorn and like Destructive Revelry. Yeah, Destructive Revelry and a Braid. Because then I might have stood a chance. Mm -hmm. um, Did you get Platinum Imperium into the dirt? I didn't. Mm -hmm. So but the, I was I just like, there's a lot of really, really potent artifacts running around that I would love to be able to explode. Mm. I hate that combo so much right now. It's so <laughs> good. And this talks about what Jared talked about before, updating a new deck. So a very dominant deck in our meta right now is Blue Moon, which is basically a blue control deck with red burn spells, and they play Blood Moon, Magus of the Moon, and Back to Basics. So they play a very simple mana deck, they play sometimes a tempo threat or like mid-rangey threats, and they just kill or counter everything you play. And the deck was fine, and it was kind of healthy to have in the meta, because it would punish people who played three to five color decks, and you know, for the greedy mana base. You want to do that. But yeah. then this stupid card called <laughs> Madcap Experiment got printed, which is a four mana sorcery for three and a red, and it basically says, reveal cards off the top of your library until you reveal an artifact card. Put that onto the battlefield, the rest on the bottom of your library in random order, and then the spell deals damage to equal the number of cards that are revealed this way. The deck only plays a single artifact, and that's well, Platinum that's Imperium. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they should only play the one. Maybe maybe they make a deck building error and they just put, dome themselves. Put the old Baleful Strix or Torrential Yeah, or, or deck. like Sensei's Divining Top. But Platinum Imperium is an 8 mana 8-8 eight, eight that says your life total can't change. Which means when the spell resolves and they've revealed 90 cards, they take no damage. And if you don't have a way to kill this thing, and it's even harder when they're playing a deck that's just 90% counter spells, you just stare at this 8-8 for the rest of the game and it kills you. And so or this sometimes is, it doesn't even need to do anything. It just sits there. It just yeah. sits there and stares at you and it's just like, yo, what's up? 
And it's so frustrating. And this is a meta thing, which is if you have more, you need answers. You can't beat yeah. this. And this is something that you know is going to be at the tournament. You know they're going to resolve at least once. They're playing pointed cards to make it more consistent so they can win this way because it just hoses so many strategies. Like, how do you beat this? So I have a specific answer, actually, from this example. I, sure. I, I, when I built, I played Blue Red Tempo on Thursday, or la the last tournament. And when I built my deck, I thought, well, OK, my deck's a little soft to Madcap Experiment right now. Okay. Uh, because I, I don't have, I'm, I'm blue and red, I don't have a ton of great answers to an 8-8, so I played cards that I would not typically play in my deck. I played Vapor Snag, I yep. played Smash the yeah. uh, and I, I played Fiery Confluence, which are your, you're normally going to play, and then in round three, I, I played against Blood Blue Moon, and I killed their Platinum Imperium twice and won the match, right? Like, it, there, it, it's, it's important to note that, like, nothing should be so powerful. Jared and I are both on the council, so we're like yeah. highly invested in this notion that nothing is so powerful that it's unbeatable. Yeah. Um, nothing should be so so unbeatable that you can't meta and adjust your deck in a way such that you are going to be more potent against it. Obviously, sometimes you're not going to draw those cards, and obviously you're still going to have those frustrating experiences. I yeah. saw you, for example, facing down a Platinum Imperium with the Swords to Plowshares in your graveyard, which presumably either got cast earlier or got countered. He cast it on turn four. He had it in his opening seven, and I used it to kill uh, whatever that stupid O4 that turns into a giant oh, bounce. thing in the ice? Yeah, I killed a stupid thing in the ice. Mm. Then he played a stupider card. And then he played a stupider card! <laughs> yep. Can't beat either of those cards. So, yeah. so talking a bit more about tech cards, one thing I'll do is I'll actually bring my maybe board, or at least oh, part of my maybe board, smart. to the tournament with me, and then I'll actually look and see who's there. <laughs> Because <laughs> if, if Surge is there and I happen to have, I have, I have I was, I'm playing, I'm playing <laughs> a, a two-color deck and I was like, I don't know if Back to Basics is going to be good tonight. And if Surge shows up, it's going right into my deck. Yeah. Uh, it's important to note that it's fine to do this before the tournament starts, but once pairings get posted, yeah, it's yeah, so yeah, long, yeah. you have yeah. to do it. Acceptable thing to do. You have to do it before before pairings are posted. You can't wait until you see you get paired against Surge, and then put like. Runation and Anathemancer <laughs> yeah. and this actually those cards in brings up a, an interesting peculiarity of our format is that like we have no sideboard. Yeah, um, this is we tried it at one point and it was a catastrophe, wasn't it? Oh, it was so bad. Yeah, it was real bad. No, no rounds ever finished on time. Well, the other uh, the other problem is there's a, lot, there's a lot of silver bullet cards in in available in vintage that you don't see in a lot of other formats, and you can bring in just like. The nastiest, narrowest hate cards Anarchy. against these, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> or or like uh, choke. You know these these just hose and entire color cards that aren't really fun. And also when you're sideboarding for a 100 card deck, <laughs> Graham's face with anarchy. Yeah, yeah so anarchy is a four mana sorcery, two red red. Just destroy all white permanents. You know, and and when you have such a huge availability of of hate cards to put in the most powerful tutors ever, it doesn't lead to more fun magic. So the challenge that we have when you're when you're when you're bringing your deck, when you're tuning your deck, when you're brewing your deck is what do I think I'm going to face? And how does my deck prepare to beat that? And how do I change my deck to give me the best possible odds without actually making my deck worse? Yeah. This also brings back the a topic we visited on quite some time ago, which is flexibility. Um, like really narrow hate cards in your main deck in Highlander are not that good. Yeah. Because like there'll be you know a matchup where it's like oh this is going to be super sweet if I draw it and just absolutely dead yeah. the rest of the time. And I mean the the point of not having a sideboard is that we're fine with you playing the really narrow hate cards, but there is a significant cost to doing so. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. is that you have a do nothing card in your deck. And, yeah. and um, we're trying to avoid the games where people get to side in anarchy. They draw it against the mono white deck, and then guess what? You won. Hooray! So that was a fun um, and interesting game of banter. So this is why the like. Uh, Effect on a stick creatures are really, really sought after in our in our format. So like Reclamation Sage, mm. which is just like, you know, two and a green for a two one. Uh, when it enters play, destroy an, an enchantment or artifact. So this is great because it blows up enchantments or artifacts. And if you encounter neither of those, it's a two one that can pick up Jite. Yeah, it carries a sword pretty yeah, well. It's just like, you know what? This is an overcosted piker, but it attacks and kills my opponent. It's even carrying a stick in the art. <laughs> and it's yeah. clearly about to be crushed by some statue. <laughs> eh, it's gonna be fine. But yeah, they're like you know, this is why the the you know charms are kinda good. Because, yeah, they're like, sick. Yeah. Well I mean like um, <laughs> 
Uh, I don't know how you could ever lose you know, if you put like 40 and commands of those There's a lot deck. of these spells that are just like really flexible. Um, yeah. And we get new ones. Like I'm, I haven't played a braid yet, but it, I've heard that it's card good. is really yeah, good. Yeah, it's it's very powerful. Because it's just like it's you're, one in a red, deal three damage to target creature or destroy target. Like this is going to be good in so many matchups. Yeah. It's like if you play, if you're facing creatures, you kill their creature. If you're facing a deck that plays like no creatures, chances are it has some number of artifacts and it'll be relevant there as well. Yeah. So I right. like I like when a new set comes out and brings something new. So Rex Sage is now a staple in our format. It's so good. But like four years ago, that card was acidic slime. Like people had or, to play a five or a mana elder. or wicker bile elder. Like people had to play four or five drops like, to get that same effect. Like tabby orangutan. <laughs> yeah, Viridian. Oh, we're gonna put this up on the. <laughs> oh god. Yeah. You're ready for some monkey boner? Not the sex monkeys. <laughs> Oh, we, right, Alex. we did it. <laughs> you almost killed Alex. I can't handle this card. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, there they go. <laughs> uh, How did that art make well, it? They have in? an extra point of toughness. Yeah, it's a two-two. Yeah, it yeah, does destroy our enchantment. Tell me, orangutan is, is two and a green for a two-two when it enters play. Destroy target artifact. This card's actually perfectly playable. It's notably, got though, horrible art. <laughs> no, not just the art. Notably, it's not May. So, oh. and it's only an artifact, so it's not an artifact or an enchantment. This so this is why Rex Sage often sees play over it, is, yeah, is this does come with some downsides. Down. Yeah. And the art is it's just yeah, so there's bad. There's a lot of bad stuff going on here. I think he's just riding on his back. It's fine. fine. Okay, sure. <laughs> Watch some David Attenborough and uh, get back to this. So Liam brought up a point when we were discussing this episode earlier that I want to discuss, which is... Uh, how do you adjust how your deck interacts with other decks? You know, is it more removal? Is it counter spells? Is it discard? And and when you're when you're looking at what your deck is trying to do and what your deck is weak to, um, how do you go about trying to to shore up those holes? Yeah, I, so I think the the reason a that this is important is that you want to make sure that you are cognizant of what you're playing against. But then once you've worked out what you're playing against. Um, you want to make sure that you sort of stay true to your deck's identity, right? Mm -hmm. you, so, if you're if you're a deck that is sort of like, a, so let's say you're like a black red aggressive deck, I mean, your solution to uh, you know, there's a lot of removal running around the format. Probably shouldn't be to start playing six drops because they're more resilient to removal, right? Your your solution is instead to start maybe playing stickier threats, so things that are harder to kill or maybe leave something behind when they die. Maybe your solution is to put more discard in your deck to try and get people's wraths out of their hands. Or just play more creatures. Yeah. Yeah, or just run run your head straight into the problem and, and well, hope that it goes away. Well, when people are playing a lot of removal, one thing you can do is cut things like equipment, things that require yeah. you to have creatures in play for that card to be useful. Because mm. if people are just killing all your creatures and you're like, Haha, I drew my grafted war gear. I'll just attach it to nothing. Nothing. I see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so if if you're playing a bunch of a bunch of equipment that requires creatures and people are killing all your creatures, perhaps it's time to shave shave some of the equipment. Shave some of the equipment and yeah, like stubborn creatures are are good. Yeah. So I was talking to Spencer Sacklin about this last night and Spencer uh, is Merfolk Master, Spencer Merfolk Master. <laughs> he uh, he's a, a very uh, well respected, very competitive player in the tournament, and does very well with aggro deck specifically. And a piece of advice he had on this which was neat was if you're going into a tournament and you know what your good matchups are don't try and make your bad matchups better. Instead, shore up the difference so you're almost guaranteed to win all the matches you're supposed to win, and then cross your fingers and hope you just dodge your bad matchups. Um, because at the end of the day, this is a competitive format, and you're just going to have bad matchups. Yeah. Um, and and I, no I can, deck can beat everything. And, 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 and the ones that do, do so at like a pretty thin margin. Yeah, but the thing I've heard is if you go into a tournament with a 60-40 list, so like a mid-range list that has 60-40 against everything, you shouldn't be surprised if you go 3-2. Like you might not win the tournament, it's going to be fine, but you're never going to go in and just crush the matchups you're supposed to win. Yep. Well, and this is like when you build a deck, and this is this is maybe a different episode in itself, but when you build a deck for a metagame, mm. sometimes you're, the metagame is like, not going to be exactly what you predicted, or you're just going to play against someone who's playing an off-meta deck. For instance, when Jer was playing mono-white mid-range, and the plan was to beat all the mono-red decks, he played against a blue deck and he lost instantly. Right? Like, this is just, it's a thing that's going to happen sometimes. You, yep. you can make all these great preparations, you can make all these good tech choices, and then all of a sudden you don't play against the thing you're meta for, and, it's important and you to, die. It's important to point out, that doesn't mean your deck's bad. No. no. In this case, it did. <laughs> but generally, it doesn't mean your deck's bad, it just means you ran into a bad matchup, 
matchups, it's uh, it's fine for bad matchups to exist. It's important to also think about that yeah. and be critical, right? You want to make sure that you're not just assuming a matchup is bad because I lost once. You want to make sure you look at it and say, okay, why did I lose? Well, it turns out all of their answers line up against all my threats really well, or maybe they're enacting a game plan that I just can't realistically yeah. expect to interact, interact with. with yeah. yeah, like mono black control is gonna struggle against Bant Enchantress Enchantment, because yep. enchantments are impossible for that deck to kill, yeah. right? Elephant Grass is the stone nuts in that matchup. <laughs> <laughs> Elephant Grass is a single green enchantment that reads, black creatures cannot attack. Oh, uh, and then it has additional text about other creatures not being able to attack. It's like cubital dot keep and yeah, yeah, all kinds of weird stuff. Yeah. And yeah. Elephant and, Grass. And something I just want to touch on is that one, one match is a really small sample size. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Like, yeah. It's possible your opponent drew well, it's possible you drew, you drew poorly. Like one or the other, or both of those things can happen. So mm -hmm. you need to give give your deck a fair chance. Yeah, yeah. One yeah. one reasonable way to think about it is like if you played a game where you drew all ten of your points, you had lands and spells in a reasonable to, like a reasonable ratio, and you still lost the game. Okay, maybe that matchup's bad, right? You drew every powerful card in your deck. You got to cast everything, and they just went, yeah, yeah. That's How do you fine. have all the answers? Yeah, and mm. that matchup might be bad. But Alex, you were gonna say something. Um, I cut you off. I think it's. Gone That's fine. Like the wind. <clears throat> one right. of my one of my favorite things is when you see two red players looking across each other with Magic of the Moon in play, yeah. and you're just like, "Cool, three mana two two, bro." And they're like, "Thanks." It's yeah. a gray ogre. Yeah, I it, like when they have Idol on of the Great Rebel in play. They both do. Those games get really. Interesting. Oh yeah, those are neat. Those are neat. So you know, just just fun stuff. Um, I want to go really quick to see if anybody has any any last thoughts they want to add before we move to the end of stuff. Jared, do you have any closing tips on what you what you'd want to tell people? No. You covered but, most of it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, look at other people's lists when they post them. Yeah. Um, you can crib notes, but like, you know, you have to do your own critical assessment on on singles because like, just because a, a, a deck won and or performed well and has this one card that you've never heard of doesn't necessarily mean that that card's good. Conversely, it might be the best card you've, you're not playing. Uh, I think that uh, it's really important that a after all of this, um, it's okay to be a brewer, it's okay to be a tuner. Mm -hmm. However you find enjoyment in building and, and adjusting decks in, for, for Magic and specifically for the Highlander format, you should feel fine about doing that. Do it uh, confidently and, and don't worry about it, right? Like, it's really, I think there is this sort of culture in, in Magic about being a net decker and, and for some reason that's not okay in some people's mind and holy crap is that not the case no. in this format. Please do whatever it takes for you to be happy and enjoying the format. Yeah. I like that there's an even split in our community between the people who have found the deck they love earlier in the Magic mm. career and then the people who bring a new list every week. So the winners and the losers <coughs> then. <laughs> <laughs> was, it, was it Chris Sutherland who won Highlander three Mondays in a row with three different decks? He's done it several times. Yeah. <coughs> Chris so, is an anomaly, man. Can we man. put him to one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Chris, you get to play nine point deck, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and then and then Allison last year won Highlander of the Year with The Rock, which she's played forever. Ten years, yeah. Ten yeah. years. So you you have you have both sides of that, which is kind of great. And when all right, I'll I'll, I'll jump in now. Yeah, nice, perfect. Uh, uh, if you see somebody's list, this is sort of jumping on. I can't remember. I think Alex was saying yeah. if you see a card in it and you're not sure, ask the person. Mm. Like if you see the list just on on Ooh. Facebook or on Tapped Out. Comment on the list and like ask questions about what you don't understand. People love, especially in our community, love to talk about their decks. Because sometimes uh, you'll see a card and you're like, I don't get this. Why the yeah. card's bad? Why is it in? And they'll explain. You'll be like, Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this dawning realization that it's either like some sort of weirdo combo piece or it just has this weird role in the deck. And sometimes you'll ask a question and be like, Why aren't you playing this? And the person just forgot that card existed and you just made their deck better. Well, great. Let's let's uh, let's go into our, our wrap-up section here. Uh, Jerry, you want to take us home with <laughs> powerful magic? I Apparently know what Liam story got he's going to tell. It's two of the hosts playing from this show. <laughs> Is One it you of, and I again? No, no it's, it's Liam and not. I. Uh, so I'm, I'm playing Big Red, which okay. is a really heavy mana deck. You're playing like 35 lands, another 20... Artifact mana sources, okay. big it's a red planeswalkers, like stompy. wildfires. Hmm. Uh, so you're trying to like start casting six mana spells and hope that's good enough. This is where Inferno Titan lives. Yeah, Inferno yeah. Titan lives yeah. here. Inferno Titan's very. And Liam is playing High Tide. And this matchup's great. This matchup is really good for Liam. 
Uh, he's a he's a combo deck. I'm playing mono red with virtually no interaction at all to stop his combo. His deck plays cards like Remand and D like Spell Pierce and Cryptic. So we're playing in game one, and I have maybe the nuttiest mana draw of all time. I have like land, mana crypt, mana vault, and and his counter spells didn't quite weren't quite fast enough. They were a little slow. Then on in game two, uh. We're playing. The game's going more normally, which okay. is terrible for me. Yeah. But I have a secret weapon. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> oh, no. I was playing Pyroblast in my deck. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh no. And when I said virtually no interaction, I meant I had exactly this card. Which one's <laughs> Pyroblast? Or we're just playing one. Just one. Oh, great. So which one's Pyroblast? <laughs> oh, my Pyroblast goodness. is a single red mana for an instant, and it says counter target spell if it is blue, or destroy target permanent if it is blue. And I was sort of hedging. I was like, oh, it's it's one mana, and I can counter their counter spell to force my thing through, or I can blow up a Jace if it's in play, yeah. or counter their big draw spell. It's yeah. it's it's risky to play this, because every time you don't play exactly. a blue deck, it it's, does nothing. It's a meta card. This yep. is exactly the kind of narrow wow. as we were talking about earlier. And, and so Liam, who is looking at me, and I've, I've been like, speaking of Inferno Titan, I like had an Inferno Titan in play, and then he bounced it, but it was in my hand. So he was starting to get kind of low. I had a little bit of pressure, but like okay. this deck doesn't apply pressure very quickly, but it <laughs> sort of, once it starts applying pressure, like it's big like- big haymaker. And so just get it over he with. decided it was it was the turn to go off. He was like, high tide. And he was like ready to cast his deck spell. And I'm like, I have a response. <laughs> oh no. Pyro blast your high tide. And if, if you're ever playing against a high tide player, always counter the high tide, because then if they, yeah. they're going to respond, they have to tap mana before their islands tap for two. Uh, and he just I went was... white, jaw dropped to the floor, and put his high tide into the graveyard <laughs> and said go. Yeah. And then I replayed my things, and then his draw step for the next turn... Oh, good. You do remember this part of the story. Oh. ...was mental misstep, which, was, which is a single blue Phyrexian mana, counter target spell... With CMC one. Here's the worst part. I wasn't dead. I just like went for it because I was like, well, there's no way he can interact with me, and I have the win in hand. But I'm not dying on my turn. I could have survived. Could have just waited. We could have drawn this mental misstep. This story could go the other way. Could be the triumphant tale of me taking it to game three. But no, that's. Oh. <sighs> and so I won like what is probably a 75-25 matchup in two. Yep. On the That's back of playing a really so sometimes you just not draw niche your, card. your worst matchup, and you have to factor that into. Wow. I have a very short story that is probably not long enough for a powerful matchup. Sure, but jump in. It's because you're talking about high tide. Great. This, this one, <laughs> this one time I was against. I can't remember who it was, but somebody else was on high tide, and I cast uh, Cabal Therapy blind. Oh, this was probably John Kilby. I think, yeah, it was definitely Kilby. Yes, it, it was. It was Kilby. And yeah, I was like, I've heard about this. Oh, Cabal one. Therapy, and I was like, What does Cabal Therapy do? Cabal Therapy is one black. Okay. Uh, you name a card, um, name a non-land card. Target Cabal player therapy. reveals his or her hand and discards all cards with that name, and it flashes back for sacred oh, creature. So, so no information. It's this card's real bad. <laughs> Mostly. Yeah. So I cast this blind. I'm like, I know he's on high tide. I was like, I don't know. Palancron. <laughs> and he just looks at me, like turns his hand over, and there it is. I'm like, oh no! <laughs> just the, the, I've gotten the soul read like once or twice. I think I got electrolyzed once with that. Do you, like, do you know what my blind. blind cabal therapy record in Highlander is? Oh, it's oh, too high. I'm seven for nine hitting blind in Highlander. <gasps> Two of them are just against me matches. in the same match. Yep. Wow. That's wow. Black. Two yeah. in the same match against Liam. Named Deceiver Exarch both times. Added oh. both times. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Well, there, that's our powerful segment, and that's our episode for today. So, uh, thank, thank you God. to all my, uh, all everyone for coming to the podcast. It's always great uh, having them in here. Thank you to the viewers at home for your support at the Patreon at patreoncom slash Run. Uh, we'll be sure to put the uh, deck list we talked about below in the comments. Uh, specifically, the druid list and <laughs> Liam's. Oh, oh yes, God, I got it. Yeah, yeah, and the druid, druid tribal. tribal? Yes. Yeah. Hey, you talked about it long enough that people are going to ask, so we'll share it. And we're going to share your tension list as well. Oh, we've got, we got his track down. Okay, who has Spencer's 
Merfolk list because I want to look. Okay, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll find that. It's one on too. the Facebook. Page. Yeah, okay. we'll get that as well. Yeah, and anyways, uh, again, we'll we'll see you soon. Thank you so much for watching.